All right, I'm going to share my screen to start and then Tyler, I will give control over to you after I'm done with my okay. spiel. Okay, so let me get this going. Everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> greetings everyone. I'm Carrie Masley and I'd like to welcome you to the first ever Society of Mississippi Archivists virtual table talk. So the theme of the first season of Table Talks will feature archivists and historians across Mississippi who have incorporated social justice themes into their workspaces, projects, and research. So before we start, um, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. We will have a brief Q&A session immediately following the presentation, and I will be monitoring questions in the chat throughout the talk. Please insert your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box, so that they aren't overlooked. We want to make sure that all of your questions are seen and responded to. So that will occur at the close of the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this presentation over to our presenters. Please welcome our speakers from Delta State University who will be presenting, We Have No Leaders, We Are All Leaders, Collecting and Celebrating the 1969 Black Student Sit-In at Delta State College. All right, so Tyler, I am going to give you the presenter privileges. And you're good to go. Yay. All right. Um, I'll get us started. Um, Hi, everybody. I'm Emily Jones, uh, and I run the Archive and Museum here at Delta State. Um, that's me when I was still a student, and I was a student worker here um, at Delta State, and wow, they let me stay. Um, so one of the first projects I ever worked on as a student was an oral history project, and it's still coming up. So where is Delta State? Delta State's in the Delta. We are not at the bottom of the Mississippi River. We are in the middle of Mississippi. Um, and we've got a few little graphics up there. Um, we have a three-story building all to ourselves where we keep all kinds of history about Delta State, but also the history of the Mississippi Delta, that great big region in the half of the heart. Um, and uh, the way that people get to use our collections is they come into our little reading room. Um, we collect all kinds of history. Uh, the little pictures on the left um, show you, uh, sometimes we get to go out and pack up history. Sometimes it just shows up in the building. Uh, sometimes donors come in and we have a great big celebration. And sometimes we just sit around and talk about stuff and get oral histories. Um, but ultimately what we try to do is put it all into some organized boxes, some organized ways, to make it accessible so that people can come back and see it, engage with it, share it, um, recognize themselves within it. Uh, we get real excited when people come back and um, open up a box and immediately start connecting with the material in there. Um, so there's the okra getting real excited. Um, and one of the collections, that uh, has started this um, uh, excitement was um, in 2005. We had uh, we had some folks moving around on campus, and a gal found a box of material in the back of a filing cabinet, um, and it happened to be original material that documented the 1969 sit-in. And this isn't what it wasn't that. We had, we, Delta State was actively not listening to itself or recognizing its own history. It's just that over time, that sit-in had uh, just kind of fallen to the wayside of uh, current communication uh, discussion. And when that teacher, uh, that, st that staff person brought me this box of, you know, old stuff that was all new again, um, 
I got excited. And a few years after that, uh, all kinds of other activities started boiling up. And it was almost like uh, we had to have that first discovery, rediscovery of our history to, um, to start the ball rolling. And this collection, um, and it took on a life of its own. Uh, one of the great things about the history of the Delta is we are kind of young. And so a lot of times our history can be reinforced by the people who, um, who lived it, who are still with, it, with us within the community. And we are really lucky uh, with this project to have someone who does have a personal uh, involvement with uh, the 1969 sit-in and the Delta and civil rights. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, Professor Sanders. Good Friday afternoon. I am Arlene Story Sanders, a retired instructor in political science at Delta State University. Good trouble, as the Honorable John Lewis called it, is relative to me. It is in my DNA. It was bequeathed to me by my father, Reverend Jody Story. My father pastored two churches the New St. Philip Missionary Baptist Church and the William Chapter Chapel Missionary Baptist Church. These churches, unlike many other churches in the Mississippi Delta, opened their doors to activists. Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer was invited to the meetings that were held at the William Chapel Missionary Baptist Church by Mrs. Mary Tucker. Her activism came out of William Chapel Missionary Baptist Church. And just a little side bit. She was put off the plantation, Marlowe's plantation. My father, Reverend Jody Story, went to pick her up off of the plantation. So you see her activism started at William Chapel. But there were other leaders and some of them were unsung but they all connected. Leaders such as Mr. Amsey Moore, Mr. Reuben Smith of Cleveland, Margaret Block and Sam Block, and Owen Brooks who played a part in this struggle at Delta State University. Mr. Perk, Mr. Beverly Perkins, Mr. Leroy Carter, and Mr. Donald Sutton. Students at Delta State College had connections with leaders. They drew their strength from the people of the Delta, and they saw it the day that they were released from parchment when the Black community gathered at the courthouse. They drew their strength. So because of these leaders, these students at Delta State College had the audacity to confront President Ewing with a list of demands, and they insisted that they were demands in spite of his opposition to the use of it. In 2009, the Diversity Committee, under the leadership of Mrs. Georgine Clark, did the Catalyst for Change program. As a result, we have a plaque that's dedicated to the courage of these students at Delta State College. So at this time, I shall see the floor to my colleague, but she's more than that to me. She is my sister friend. She is my sister in power, Dr. Carrie Freshhauer. Thank you so much, Professor Sanders. It's hard to follow you. <laughs> um, so the Delta has, as many of you on this call know, such a rich history as an epicenter of the civil rights movement, of black radicalism, but also of the afterlives of slavery and white supremacy. Um, when I arrived in the fall of 2018, I didn't know much about Cleveland, Mississippi. That is until I met with and spoke with our last speaker, Professor Arlene Sanders. Um, Professor Sanders has this deep and rich personal understanding of Cleveland and especially Black Cleveland and the Civil Rights Movement because of the role her family played. 
So I sat with her for hours in her office and with her family after church over the most delicious food uh, to learn as much as I could. And she showed me artifacts from her time at Delta State, including a pamphlet showcasing the history of the student sit-ins, um, which you saw on the previous slide. It was through the work of black faculty like Professor Sanders and Professor Georgine Clark that the university recognized this history, um, as well as archivists like Emily Jones, who you heard speak at the beginning. Um, and I wanted to learn more, and luckily so did Professor Sanders. Um, as I met with people on campus, I often pestered Michelle Johansson, photoed here with Professor Sanders, um, who is a professor of history and member of the Delta State Diversity Committee. And the stars magically aligned as Michelle shared with me a box that Emily found just a few weeks prior labeled student unrest. Emily allowed me to sit with this box, taking photos of its contents over several days and learning about Emily's knowledge of this local history. In that box, I found the students' demands and newspaper clippings about the event. The Black Student Organization, the Black Student Organization presented a letter to the admin alongside a list of 10 demands. And that's this letter is, um, I'll show you in just a minute. Yeah. And what was fascinating to me, um, as I looked through that box, alongside of these demands were handwritten meeting minutes listing participants like Fannie Lou Hamer of Ruleville, like Amzie Moore, a, a Cleveland local, and activist Owen Brooks. Um, and so this letter of list of demands really quickly, students were really focused on um, the climate at Delta State College at that time, their treatment by faculty, what they saw as unfair grading, the lack of scholarships and support, the lack of black faculty on campus. Um, this was of course part of a Nash, and sorry, Tyler, could you go back one slide? Um, so on the left here, you see um, a press release by the university. On the right, this is the notes on the administration's response to student unrest. Um, this was part of a national network of university responses to uprisings starting in Kent, but including a local response to unrest, unrest at Jackson State University and the University of Mississippi. And it's important to remember that Delta State College ended its white only admission policy with the admission of its first black students, Helen Mitchell, Sandra Morgan, and Arnett Rainey only in 1966. So integration was met with resistance and public opposition and relationships between black and white students and faculty remain tense. So the unrest we see growing among a group of black students on campus was in sync with the larger black student movement across the state and the country. And here the growing student movement came to head with the civil rights movement and emerging black power movement across the state. Um, and from that day forward, I worked closely with Professor Sanders to write a grant for the MDNHA. We also received guidance from Dr. Rolando Hertz, head of the Delta Center, Dr. Brian Foster, sociologist at University of Mississippi, and Dr. Chuck Westmoreland and Andrew Wegman, historians at Delta State. Our focus on oral histories has been central to this project as a way to rewrite history from the bottom up. And as I often remind my, my students, right, history is written from often from the vantage point of the victors. And particularly in the South, um, this history is, is often whitewashed in a way, right? So in this practice, we wanted to center the students and their relationships to the Black community of Cleveland, Mississippi. And this project was perfect for the revamped social justice club. So we pitched it to these amazing students. Um, Tyler Wells was one of these students and he'll share a little bit about that process now. Hello everybody, I'm Tyler Wells. I graduated from Delta State in May and will start uh, my graduate studies in commercial aviation at Delta State this fall. In the fall of 2018, Dr. Freshour came to the Social Justice Club meeting and said, uh, we have this oral history project that we would like for you to be a part of. Uh, we're looking for volunteers to go and interview these people who were part of a sit-in. I, not originally from Mississippi, did not know that much about uh, a sit-in other than there was a plaque on the first floor of the building where most of my classes were held. So I was all for this. Myself and uh, several other students signed up to do this and uh, we, had to, we, we, we had to organize ourselves and understand that it was very important that this story be shared but be very sensitive to the experiences that the uh, 
participants went through. We were told that some of them might not really want to share anything. They might, even though it's 50 years later, they might not uh, be that excited to talk about something like that. Ultimately, we found that most of them were quite receptive and quite willing to share their stories. And so we learned new technologies such as digital recorders and effective interviewing practices and things like that. And in May of 2019, uh, we took the nascent early, early, early uh, efforts that we had undertaken uh, to a conference in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, after that summer, I had some other things that I had to take care of, and I turned it over to Sakina Butts, uh, who will now share the second half of uh, our student involvement. Hello, everyone. My name is Sakina Butts, and I started working on the project in the fall of 2019 with the first student cohort graduating in the spring of 2019. The project sort of took a pause, and we all had to come back and regather ourselves because a lot of the initial leadership had um, graduated or even moved on. So we really had to organize and map out the next phase of the project. The, net, the dynamics of the project changed from its initial form. We were no longer only doing recording or histories with the participants, but we joined it with the Digital Media Arts Center to do a documentary around the sit-in. Mr. Fisher would explain more about that collaboration in just a moment, but we the students were no longer going out into the field to interview people, but we were instead bringing the participants to campus to do interviews. Currently, we're approaching the end of phase one and finishing up interviews with as many participants as we can find from the initial 52 students that participated. And we're migrating through COVID-19 and figuring out how to do that safely, but also planning um, how we're going to finish up the project within the scope of the next year. This fall, hopefully, we'll be able to get some footage around campus for key areas where the student actually happened at, like the old president's building at Keekley Hall. Oh, and next, I will pass it all to Mr. Ted Fisher with the Digital Media Arts Center. Thank you. What you are seeing on screen right now are some stills from the actual film. So as Sakina and a few other people mentioned, we've been able to sort of support and augment what's happening. And this meant that the participants came into the Digital Media Arts Center and were interviewed by, for example, Arlene Sanders and Sakina and Tyler and um, were recorded for the project and also, of course, to tell the actual story. So you're seeing on here, uh, uh, four of the participants and also Georgian, Dr. Georgian uh, Clark and Sakina. And right now, to give you a little idea of the film, uh, it opens up with uh, a segment on three of these participants and, and goes to back to, well, this was a bit forgotten. How did students find out about it and what are they seeing? So if you could, Tyler, let's play the clip that comes in around three minutes into the film. So I don't have original ties in Cleveland, Mississippi. I got involved with the Rosa Freeman Project and they were talking about Martin Luther King, they were talking about Rosa Parks. Like So I don't have original ties in Cleveland, Mississippi. I got involved with the Rosa Freeman Project, and they weren't talking about Martin Luther King. They were talking about Rosa Parks, like the major thing. They were talking about people that live like right here in the town. I started to do a little research. I looked on Delta State University site. There's only a, like a memorial event. They show them smiling and the plaque, like, hey, okay, we moved on. 
And then I realized there's no archives of their stories. There's no collection of their voices. As I learned more and like as I did self-study, I became more invested in it. Like getting actually to speak with the people, getting actually to record their story, lets me know like I have a place just as they had a place in the students. So I have a part in like making sure that the history is preserved to me just like amazing. I have my experience, but I also get to document and actually interview people that were that helped me have the experience that I'm having now as a student at Delta State. Hey, Ms. Buckner. Hi. Hello. I'm awesome, ma'am. How are you? All right. It's it's always a challenge to uh, show video in the age of Zoom and WebEx, but I, I think you may have gotten the idea there uh, that we're seeing is, is, is again, giving us a little idea of uh, making a connection with this story and then exploring it and researching it, which, of course, is very significant since we're 50 years out from the event. So what this is made up of is in the Digital Media Arts Center, we've had a small crew, usually three to five people uh, recording, and they are students in our program. Some of them are very parallel to the people who were involved in the protest. So for example, Antonia Cannon is in his 20s and was born in Cleveland, and he is interviewing or is working the camera while there's an interview of someone who is, was in their 20s and from Cleveland when the protests happened. And this has been a sort of amazing thing to see, This span across 50 years of time and is also i think uh given us a good chance to go with direct history straight from people's mouths and to really take a perspective on this that uh, i think will be something you you uh in the end will find a story emerging from that you will see that uh as much as articles and other things uh, give us the history, the history also kind of needs a story on top of it, that we hear what people thought and felt, and then we see how people reflect on that so many decades later. So picture three camera shoot usually, lots of microphones, three cameras, uh, students running sound and uh, helping with the setup and then filming it. And we're now in the process of editing those. So what you're seeing on the screen now is a sort of a, a screen capture from the current edit of the film. and. Uh, what we're ending up with this is about a 26 minute PBS style documentary. As we get closer to having the content we want, we're now bringing it back to people who are involved with the film. The people you just heard on all of our discussion today will get a chance to see things as they emerge and, and we will sort of try to make this fit uh, a narrative that all those who have an interest in it get to say something about it, that we don't just come in in extractive form and bring in uh, somebody flies in from out of Mississippi, records stuff, takes it away, and, and heroically shows the film. This is really meant to be an effort that reflects the community and the voices that were involved in all these events. And then the rehabilitation of those events, the uh, uh, dig into the history and the dig into what it means. Now, a couple things I want to just bring forward, since you're all archi archivists, is you may have noticed, a little hard to see in our WebEx, but one of the photos there is the wrong resolution. And so we're at a point now we are digging in, finding more and things that we can get in the best possible quality. Interviews are fine, but there's a lot of archival material. So if you have something, feel free to contact us. So we may uh, find we need more. Uh, and also, as Sakina mentioned, we have sort of stopped for a second as the quarantine and the uh, lockdown has happened. And for a second, I thought this is a disaster. We can't shoot what we want. And then the next day I sort of woke up and said, well, actually it's good. We can spend more time reconsidering what we're doing and finding the right parts and really letting the story come out of all these hours of interview. Last thing I want to say before passing it on is as archivists, you may also be interested to know that we now beyond the traditional oral history method where you record some audio and there's some files, we now have a new archivist problem, which is we have 4K video and we have several types of audio and we have things that are sort of uh, difficult to store and to get to the future generation so someone can come back in 10 years and relook at this history. We're going to really work on that, including materials that maybe don't make it in the film but are significant. With that, I want to talk about the, or pass it on to Michelle Johansson to talk about where all of this is going next. Thanks, Ted. Um, so we have all of this amazing footage and oral histories and just information that's 
pouring in right now. And so we want to make sure that this is accessible, not only at Delta site through the archives and the work that everybody's been doing, but to a broader audience. And so uh, we've all taken a part in uh, making sure that this information and the stories is sent out um, across the state. And so uh, Ted Fresh Hour, Arlene Sanders, and Sakina Butts are writing an article for Mississippi History Now, which is the online publication through the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. So uh, we are excited about that, that this will be part of uh, other people's uh, curriculum, that this can be shared not only throughout the Delta, but also throughout Mississippi. Um, we are working on the incorporation of this information uh, into our DSU first year seminar courses, as you heard from Sakina and Tyler. Um, this is important information. It can be life changing for students and connecting them to the history of Delta State and giving them a greater sense of belonging. And so we are really excited about that. Um, Tyler is working on a dynamic website for uh, this project uh, that will be constantly updated and will offer easy access to eventually the film, to the oral history uh, transcripts to any kind of information and will be a, a main contact area for people if they have, if they find things that they want to share with us. And then we're also looking at what happens afterwards, what happened after 19, March 10th, 1969. As you saw from the list of demands, um, we want to follow up on what happened afterwards. So we're expanding our oral histories to include former black students, faculty, staff, administrators, people with intimate knowledge of what happened in the aftermath of this uh, sit-in to show that these truly were heroic catalysts for change on campus. Um, and also to examine what are we doing at Delta State currently. And, uh, and so we're really excited about this so that it's not just looking at the past, um, but also contextualizing where we are today and giving greater understanding to our students and faculty and staff on campus. So I'm going to turn it back over to Emily at the archive uh, so she can talk a little bit more about what's happening. Okay. Oh my goodness, archivist. <laughs> I, I feel like some of my, my archives people are probably going, how did I get so lucky? How do I become Emily Jones? Um, <laughs> let me just tell you, I didn't do any of this. Um, Y'all all know this. We sit, as archivists, we sit in the midst, literally, right now, in the midst of great stories and great material. And sometimes the hardest part is pushing it out there to interact with um, anybody. The way, um, just how to incorporate it into your daily conversations, um, how to make sure that you're aware of it so that you don't you know, walk around thinking that, you know, this is the way we've always done it. Well, you know, you have a frame of reference. And so I'm very thankful for every uh, student and faculty and staff that comes into the archive. Um, it, it occurred to me as I was playing with my necklace uh, a couple of days ago that, you know, um, collections are like pearls. The more you handle them and the more you, um, you know, you hold them close and you, you protect them and cherish them. They're like collections. The more you handle them, the more you dig down into them, the more you see, understand what you're looking at and where the personal connections might jump out of the box and reach over a, a row and touch another bar. But it, it, once you understand that, it plays so much into um, uh, the whole narrative of, um, you know, for this collection, we're talking about an event that happened in 1969. But look at how long it has been here. It's been, it's, it's now living yet again, and it's getting this new life every person who touches this collection seems to get excited about it and develop a way to, to interact with it um, all over again. Um, anyway, uh, I can get real excited <laughs> about how uh, folks deal with the, with the archives and when they come in and they're like, I don't really know what I wanna be when I grow up, but um, got anything interesting? And I have to show them a box and all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, this is my life story, I, I need to do this. 
Um, and so I love when Sakina uh, connects with the collection that way and, and how she finds herself um, into, um, into the archives um, and into the history of the university. Um, so the collection and the archive is here to collect things that have happened, but ha also hopefully to push things out and keep people moving forward and to keep um, action going. Uh, so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the, the opportunity I have to work with folks that uh, have the ability and the technology. And they answer their emails and call me back. That is marvelous. Um, I think those were the points that I wanted to go over right now. We can answer other questions later um, if anybody has any specific about um, the collections and where I think the next step could be for this collection in particular. But um, really, I want to turn it over to Sakina uh, right now, and um, she's going to describe how the project has affected change, uh, all kinds of different change. So here you go, Sakina. Wow. <laughs> Hey, I'm here to cover a portion on um, this segment and how the 1969 protests relate to students now. And I think that question revolves around student-led activism. And there are the questions of like, who are activists? Who are student activists? And what is activism? And these questions are all relevant to the 1969 student protests and also the protests that are happening now in 2020. Now students are becoming aware of the injustice and taking action to make social change. In 1969, students made social change on the campus within their own circles, and there seems to be this thing of generation after generation picking up the next step. We're seeing this across Mississippi and even here in Cleveland, Mississippi, as you can see on the photo, that we had a, a protest and some of the people that were in the protest were local students from BSU. And we're seeing that is a lot of symbolic symbols that are for white supremacy, such as Confederate statues, such as Confederate flag, that are coming down. And a lot of this change that is happening is due to the uproar of student activists who are saying that we recognize that honoring these monuments is an injustice to Black Mississippians, Black Americans, and America overall, in that sense that we're honoring the wrong side of history. And it goes back to the representation and what we mean by inclusion and integration. And that goes back to some of the same demands that the students were demanding in the 1969 system and what they want to implement it. So inclusion and equity has to be more than simply having someone of a different race in the room. Overall, I think this goes back to the fight that the Black students were aiming towards in 1969. And I think it was very much goals and related to the activism of students right now in this moment. Personally, I did not feel that Nova State was like, for me, or there was something there of my own until I started working on this project. My hope is to help finish up this project and have it serve as something that all Delta State students can feel as their own. And now I'll pass it on to Michelle to um, thank our supporters. So a project of this scale, which is multi-year, uh, multimedia, encompassing so many different departments, um, we have a lot of people to thank. But first and foremost, we want to thank the 1969 sit-in participants. They have been incredibly generous with their time and uh, their memories that they've shared with us, actual phys physical objects that they've uh, shared with us. I know that Sakina has, you know, driven places to go pick up, you know, like a box or some letters and some, some things that the participants wanted to share. So we are incredibly grateful for their, uh, their stories that they did this and that they're willing to share this with us now uh, and their participation and their patience as we work on how we continue this project through the pandemic. Um, obviously, a lot of the folks uh, who are involved in this are older, and so we want to make sure that their safety comes first. And so we um, are waiting patiently for that, but continuing on where we can, as Ted talked about, um, as far as making sure that the film is intentional and we're making sure that we, we're telling a full story of this. So we are incredibly thankful for the participants and their families for 
for allowing us the opportunity. We also would like to thank lots of supporters and partners. This is not the full complete list and it continues to grow as more people get involved. We're hoping to have another cohort of students in the fall um, to continue this project. Um, first and foremost, obviously Delta State University. Um, and this is, these are just some of the offices that are listed here who have uh, contributed uh, funding, time people who you know we were able to call up and say hey we need a little bit of help here and so uh, we are grateful for that support from our institution we are also extremely grateful for the mississippi delta national heritage area um, for a grant uh, from them to really push this project into uh into a new level um, our delta state students you see tyler and sakina but there are many others who have contributed to this project um and uh you know, Georgine Clark was mentioned earlier, and we greatly appreciate her um, wisdom and guidance and uh, insight into this project. And uh, Dr. Charles Westmoreland, who uh, is the, the Division of Social Sciences and History, the interim chair, um, uh, for really his guidance and being one of the interviewees to help us put this all together. So we are extremely grateful for all of the support and very appreciative. And Tyler, I think there's one more slide just about the Mississippi Delta National Heritage Area. There we go. Um, again, this is wonderful. Delta State um, is, is always happy to be a partner with Mississippi Delta National Heritage Area under the guidance of, and leadership of Dr. Rolando Hertz at Delta State. And so he is literally right across the street from us at Delta State. Um, and so we pop over there a lot and uh, we, we greatly appreciate this, this support. And I think we are going to entertain questions uh, at this point. So if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them for you. Are we, are we waiting on um, questions to show up in the q and A? I and may have <laughs> while we wait on questions of people in the audience wouldn't mind like just sharing where you're from or if you're from Delta State, I think that's kind of cool to see. Um, how many former students or current students are in the audience? I've got one. I mean, I'm not it. I mean, I am it, but I mean, I am one. But um, hi, Aaron. <laughs> Aaron Newman is here. Another Delta State graduate. Say hello. Um, well, while we wait on quite, oh, there's a question. Um, had any participants in the project seen the Starkville Civil Rights Project? Hmm. I have not. So, Cherry, do you see these questions or? Yeah, thanks, Dee Dee. I, I don't think we have, but I think we can look that up. If you want to share that, a link or any information you have, uh, Dee Dee Baldwin presented that question. And then, there. oh, thank you. They, they put the link in the, in the chat or in the Q&A. And then we have a question from Lorraine Stewart. What happened on March 10th, 1969? Maybe Sakina, Tyler. Y'all can answer that question. Uh, 
Sure, I can start off. Um, from the accounts of the students, what happened is that um, they planned, they planned it. They really didn't plan what was going to happen on March the 10th, but together it was sort of like a sporadic thing and they decided to go and protest um, outside on the line. And so when they were protesting on the line, apparently they were protesting the demands that they were protesting for the president Ewing to like answer to the demands that they had put out previously in February, I think it was on February 27th. And his response was not to get their demands, but instead that they sent a bus and they sent the whole cohort of 52 students off to parchment prison. And so on that day, they were loaded onto a black bus um, and sent to parchment prison and stayed there overnight. I think, Tyler, is there anything that you think I should add in? It's just like a brief description of what happened on March 10th. I think that's I think that's pretty much you know, hits the nail on the head as to what happened on the day of the actual sit-in. But it's important, I think, to realize that it was not, you know, these people didn't get up on that morning and say, we're going to go storm the president's office. There were a series of events, you know, both in the classroom, in the dormitory, in the cafeteria, all over campus. And it was like, you know, it was like you just keep keep picking one thing after another, you know, just that's and finally they said, you know what? This is for the birds. We're not gonna take it anymore. And and so I that's the only thing I would add to that. Yeah, I'd like to add one more thing. So this is um as Tyler said, there was a sequence of events. It wasn't completely random. Right, students had already presented the president with a list of demands pre leading up to the sit-in. So that was on February 27th, 1969. Um, and they had been coordinating, as we talked a little bit before, with members of the community and, and learning actually from local activists. Um, and Sakina shared that students were taken to Parchman um, after, it's really quite fascinating. I think one of the coolest parts of the history that I've learned is that how Parchman felt for the students and what they experienced while they were in Parchman. Um, many of the participants talked about singing freedom songs within the within the jail cells, and they were kept on death row, surprisingly, to keep them away from the general population, I guess. Um, but the, uh, the, the rest of the population were, um, taught them how to communicate with each other um, and asked them to politely to stop singing, that they supported their, their mission, but to stop singing the freedom songs. Um, but I think, I think that was a really, really fascinating part of this history that we had never been exposed to until talking to participants. And something else I'd like to add, um, that when they returned from parchment at that courthouse and they were met by community residents that were willing to pay their bond and how that that support was overwhelming to them. I've got a few other questions um, from the audience. I guess I think Carrie Masley's having trouble with the microphone. Um, Can y'all hear me now? Oh, yes. Yes, I had to switch my microphone out. <laughs> my other one just died in the middle of the presentation, so I apologize. Um, I kind of lost where we were, though, because um, I was you know, doing tech work. So if you want to continue on, Carrie, that'd be great. You're doing a wonderful job. OK, um, thanks, Car Carrie and Carrie. Um, so <laughs> funny. <laughs> A few questions and maybe we can just let anyone answer, but Karen um, has asked, how will this be shared with the university community and students? Um, and then another person has asked, um, uh, what was the, Archie has asked, what was the catalyst or inspiration that inspired this project? Um, and then finally, there was a question on, um, how has the current administration responded to this project? Um, and has this project uh, made any of the students interested in going into the archives? Um, so there are a few questions there. Why not?
Did I'm Kane happy to and Tyler, do y'all want to become archivists? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll keep the awesomeness to myself. All right. Go, Michelle. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, I was going to say the current administration is very supportive of this project. Um, we had uh, in the spring of 2019, we had um, a presentation, a public presentation, um, and uh, the president of the university, uh, the provost, most of the cabinet, um, the vice president of student affairs, they all came and I think really became uh, even more invested into telling the story and making sure that our students, um, uh, our current students know about the story and that the story is spread uh, throughout the university. Um, so we've received a lot of support, both uh, in funding, um, we've applied for uh, funding from different offices. And so uh, that's been helpful along with the MD and HA grant. Um, and just again, like time and resources of other people that we've, you know, called up. Um, uh, institutional research has been very helpful when we we're trying to figure out statistics and who was there and who were faculty involved at that time, you know, 1969. Um, that's a long time ago, so finding these records um, has been important. And so uh, I think that there's been a lot of support for this and the continuation of this. Um, as far as how are we going to get this out into the community? Of course, we had planned as part of the original grant um, a big community celebration and traveling exhibits and going to schools. Um, that's not going to be possible just yet. Um, so again, we're we're doing it in this way with webinars and, and such. Um, and as we again have to regroup in the fall, as we see where our students are with this project now, recruiting new students and such, we'll we'll make some adjustments. But we want to make sure that this is available to everybody through the website, through publicity, through first year seminar, through as many ways that we can get this out as possible. So um, we and once it is safe for us to do public events again. Um, we will we will definitely be doing that. So um, I hope that answers some of the questions. Also, um, I was tasked by President LaForge to lead a task force on African American student participation. Um, Michelle served on that task force with me as well as Dr. Tamika Simmons. As we got a mini grant from the Kettering Foundation to hold focus groups for an entire month with African American students to see what it was that um, they were lacking at Delta State and what they would like to see. So here we are inching towards what these black students wanted a deal to state. Yeah, I think um, to follow up the demands um, around the demands, that's is the next step of the project that Michelle mentioned before that we are going to try um, better and more concretely understand how many of those demands are actually in the years following the sit ins. Um, but I do think with that task force right there, we still need to uh, as students and faculty are still applying pressure to the administration to hire more flat black faculty to include more um, black history and black studies courses. And this is the kind of institutional change that I think is happening across the country, right? It, it is um, disheartening that's 2020 and these are these demands are still being made, right? So it's not, I think it's important that we remain critical, not only of Delta State, but of our entire educational system. and and our lack of black history and black critical history. You know, symbolism, uh, and I hope that our students don't get caught up in the symbolism, the, the removing of Confederate statues, the removing of flags, but I hope that we will, and our students will continue to pressure for substantive change. As you say, uh, black studies programs, or multicultural studies program. So we hope to see this to move beyond symbolism and don't just get happy with symbolism. There are a few questions that I can answer. Um, and I think the one that I saw was the last one that was posted and it was asking about, are there more firsthand student accounts? And yes, we have more firsthand student accounts. Those are in the form of oral histories that we have already, and also some um, 
the recorded interviews that we have for the documentary, but a lot of those will not be released until the website is up and the documentary will probably not be ready until the next upcoming year because of the time that it takes for editing. And then another question that was, um, were most of the students able to continue at DSU and graduate? Yes, they were able to continue and graduate the ones that chose to stay from the participants that we have talked to. I know Ms. Maggie Crawford, she was one of the participants that um, graduated from Delta State. She actually graduated in 1970, if I'm not mistaken. And then some of the students that I've talked to, um, they decided to leave Delta State after that encounter. And how connected to DSU do the sit-in participants feel to DSU today? That answer is subjective depending on the person that you talk to. Some people are like, some people are like, okay, yes, I'm very proud of Delta State. I graduated from there, but I know there were some participants that I called and reached out to an interview with. They did not want to speak about it. I don't know if they finished at Delta State, but they wanted nothing to do with Delta State University. And the inspiration behind the catalyst. So the catalyst was led by Dr. Georgine Clark. I miss Georgine Clark. And she was actually over a task force, I think, to put on the 2009 Catalyst event that happened here at Delta State University. And that sort of was first, like the first memorial or the first recognition really of the city and participants that happened there. And the Catalyst was, I guess, sort of like the first stage. So it was just like from 1969 to 2009, there was just like this blank period of, you know, no recognition really from the university or incentive or, you know, just um, starting of the project are like trying to recognize these people and honoring them and their stories. And then 10 years later, 2019, 2018, this is when we started on the project. And that, that first Catalyst Change Program, it was sponsored by the Diversity Committee. And the goal was because here we, we had this information and now let's do something with it. So we didn't want the struggles, of uh, those students to be forgotten. And they were so happy to have been recognized in that program, at that program. But even so, in my classes, students don't even know where the, they sit in the lobby, but they've never seen that plaque. They never paid attention to it. So I actually took my classes down to see the plaque. And I hope, as Michelle said, with first year, uh, seminar students that they will take them to actually see that play. So I don't know if this question has been answered. Um, a couple of people are wanting to know, you know, what actually happened during the sit in. Um, could someone provide an overview of the event? I, I can talk a tiny bit based on what the interview subject said in our interviews and laid it out for me because like that person who asked the question, I, I didn't know that specific history and it also um, is less obvious than, than you might think because uh, there are some specifics that happened that uh, it's great to hear straight from someone's mouth in this case. So there is a little bit of confusion in some cases because on that day I, I i forget who said it but there were several things that happened it wasn't that there was a massive plan to go and take the president's mm -hmm. office and so on um so there was an event at the at the uh, student center and there was a according to reports uh, a, a group outside the president's house with a, a bit of a protest and there was a circling of the flagpole with posters and so on uh, but what the step up moment was, was this idea of going into the hall in Keithley and the president's office. So when that happens, that's what is sort of from the accounts I've heard the escalation. So, for example, the student president at that time, the president of the student body or SGA uh, t talks about in his interview running over to see this and going between the protesters and the university president. And he gives this account of. Uh, what happens that escalates it. So we hear from Mary Carter, who's in the hallway, and we hear from Talmadge Davis, who's in the hallway, and we uh, hear from Maggie Crawford, who says, from her perspective, she's the one who said, let's take the president's office. Uh, and then we hear from uh, Jim Powers or James Powers, who says, 
an account of when an officer appears and tells people they will be arrested and so on. And that kind of escalation that went beyond the other protests, where in the other protests, there wasn't this uh, moment where the police were brought in. And I think Sakina mentioned in her interview, this kind of thing that is a little shocking about the university deciding to bring in the police to that point, or National Guard, or the also Mississippi Highway uh, Patrol, I think. And that is a really interesting thing. That when students were going around a flagpole, well, there's not really a need for much. And then to make the decision for bringing in people that are essentially armed and are very serious, as Maggie Crawford says, about getting students off campus. So in the understanding I have of it, the students are in the hallway for a period of time, and again, singing Freedom Rider songs, but not much else is happening. They're not really doing anything in the hallway or to anyone. There's some conversations that seem to happen. Uh, no one in a firsthand account uh, has made it 100% clear what you know is said between the president and others at that point, but the police show up, or the highway patrolman, or the Mississippi uh, uh, National Guard, and a countdown is given. You got to get out of this hallway or we're going to arrest you. And then 52 people are, 51 participants are brought to a bus to be taken to a prison and a 52nd participant who uh, almost volunteers for it saying you should take me too. Uh, and then they are taken away to what they thought might be the downtown prison. And then there's no room or not enough room there, eventually parchment. So on that day, there is this shift from the series of protests that had happened that were you know, sort of expected to this massive escalation, including some thought, thought and feared might be violent uh, from the um, arrests and the highly armed people on a very close proximity to people in a small hallway. Uh, as you can know in your mind, how dangerous that might become. One of the participants talks very much about uh, realizing that they could be shot. Uh, and from that point, uh, as a couple of people have hinted, that night at Parchment is very significant. And then the next day, a return to the courthouse and some of the things that happened there. So one of the things that happened for me in hearing these accounts is that you do get slight differences in how people remember things. Um, and I think we always put ourselves at the center of a story when we're being interviewed about it. Uh, but there does seem to be a pretty clear agreement of this sort of moment the students are in and essentially sitting down and singing and armed uh, security of one type and another shows up and then arrests are made. I have not heard anyone talk about a, a couple things I'm curious about uh, in that process, but uh, I think you can picture um, that this was essentially called for by the university, right? It's not that, so that the highway patrol and the National Guard happens to show up, right? There is a sort of uh, a moment when someone must have essentially called them in. I think that's, from a historical point, very interesting. Uh, from the standpoint of the people involved in it, they wouldn't necessarily know. They wouldn't be at the phone call where people are called in. They would just see the highway patrolman arrive. Don't want to take any more time with that, but I just want to make sure everyone's sort of clear that that's sort of why March 10th becomes the center of the story. There are on March 3rd and other dates, and someone said February 27th, event. It's 10th that it becomes a matter where people are actually arrested and actually taken off the campus. And it's of your 70, or depending on, on how you're doing the campus, about 70 uh, students who are now integrated in the program, 51 of them are taken off campus to Parchman. Uh, that to me is a big moment in this story, where it's not just there is a set of problems and a protest. This is now something that escalates into a life changing event. With that, I'll, I'll stop. Maybe someone else wants to add to that. Okay, I think we may have um, time for maybe a, a, a quick uh, question. It is getting close to one o'clock. However, um, Carrie, you said that there was maybe a participant of the, of the sit-in here with us today. Did you want to? Um, make a statement about that. Um, yeah, I, we just are seeing in the chat. Um, Yvonne Stanford is in the audience and is someone who participated in the sit ins and also participated in this project. So we want to really um, thank you her, for her participation and for being here today. Um, we also know that Miss Maggie Crawford is here. 
Um, and several of the other participants, Jennifer Buckner sends her regards. Um, uh, Lula Jones might be here as well. Um, and we just want to make sure to recognize um, their presence here. And hopefully we can have a follow up um, a session where we screen the documentary and we have those uh, participants on the panel um, instead of us, right? So uh, just thank you so much for being here. We're honored to have y'all here. Awesome. Thank you guys so much again for um for doing this and, and sharing this presentation with us. Um, I'm going to take control back from Tyler real quick. Um, I promise I'm going to. I'm going to let everyone out of here very, very soon. I just want to, to point out a few things um, before we say goodbye. Um, let's see. So again, I just want to thank you all so much for being here today, especially to our panelists and our special guests, the um, participants of the, um, the sit-in. Thank you so, so, so much for being here today. Um, I do want to point out that this session is being recorded. Um, the recording will probably be um, ready sometime this weekend, so we'll make sure that it gets posted on our social media channels and our website um, sometime next week. So please be on the lookout for that if you want to watch it again or if you have people that you want to share that recording with. Um, I also want to point out that our next virtual table talk will be on September 25th at 12 o'clock um, entitled uh, Community Collaboration, the Margaret Walker Center and the Scott Ford House, Inc. And that'll be given by two um, speakers of the Margaret Walker Center, Angela D. Stewart and Dr. Alfertine um, Harrison. Also, I want to point out that if any of our archivists, our Mississippi archivists in the audience today is interested in giving a virtual table talk, please shoot me an email and I can send you more information on how you can um, participate. And if you want to learn more about the Society of Mississippi Archivists or how to become more involved, please visit our website um, listed on the slide. So if there are no other questions or comments, I'm going to call this one done. And again, thank you so much to um to our panelists. I really appreciate all of your time and hard work that you've put in into this um, presentation. So thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. I feel like I'm saying th thank you a thousand times, but I really do appreciate your time and effort on this. So um, it's good to see you and have a good weekend.